Okay, yeah. I'm Barefoot Ted. I am the character in the book Born to Run, and um, chapter 25, verse 1, starts out with this, I like saying it that way, what I consider to be one of the finest sentences in all of American literature. It goes like this. Barefoot Ted was right, of course. <laughs> so what am I right about? What is it that I was right about? Well, here is something that uh, as a late 20th century person, I wasn't really certain of, and it was, everybody was telling me and all of us that that wasn't the case, but I came to the conclusion that being a human being is a really interesting thing to be. It is super awesome, actually, that we've been born into these bodies with the capacities that we have. And at the end of the 20th century, everybody was like, we were broken, we needed all kinds of tools to do all the various things we needed. We needed experts to tell us how to do this, that, and the other thing. And one of the most fundamental things, it turns out, about human beings is some of our very primal capacities. And one of our most primal capacities, and this is coming from a guy named Dr. Daniel Lieberman at Harvard University, and this is how I'm gonna tie in who I am with what we're doing here. We are here because we're at the Sweat Summit, okay? What other animals would attend the Sweat Summit? What other primate would be here? Would an orangutan be here? Would a giraffe? Would a dog? No. You know what? Human beings are very interesting critters. We're, when you add heat, time, and distance to the equation, did you realize human beings are the longest distance endurance animal on the planet? And that for huge periods of our own personal history as a species, our primary method of getting super nutrient dense food was done without even using a weapon? Now there's a guy named Louis Liebenberg out of South Africa who wrote an incredible book who inspired this guy at Harvard University named Daniel Lieberman who came out, he was studying on the human brain and our skull and he started realizing there's something about us that makes us extraordinarily unique and he started kind of drilling down from there and the thing is is that we have what's called a nuchal ligament. And what that allows an animal to do, like a human being, is to move in such a way so that while we're running, our head doesn't lose sync with our body, which is allows us to follow things while we're moving. And Louis Liebenberg ended up writing a book called The Art of Tracking the Origins of Science. And this book makes the, uh, comes up with the idea that human beings predating even any of the most basic weapons had become incredibly sophisticated hunters, and indeed the San people of South Africa still do this. A tribe in northern Mexico that I went and hung out with called Taro Mara were still doing this up until recently. They've transferred running after a deer until it dies to tra tracking down peyote, which uh, you already know in your film. So what really got int interesting to me, it got interesting uh, to me was if this is our capacity, certainly that means that it should be something we do, we can do well. When a bird flies, it doesn't break. Its wings don't break from flying. It generally gets stronger and better with use and eventually wears out. A fish, when it swims, doesn't wear out by doing its natural movement pattern. You know, a deer doesn't break down from running through the forest. Why were human beings constantly breaking down in our urge to do the one thing, one very primal and special thing that we are the masters at, running? My own personal journey led me to research why. And it turned out in the craziest of all, you know, counterintuitive things, it turns out that human beings were already born with the perfect e equipment for moving really well on their own two feet. Maybe not in every environment, maybe not in every situation, but we had lost the fundamental movement pattern that was allowing us to run in the efficient and smooth way. And this is what Dr. Daniel Lieberman ended up doing a whole book on, or a whole bunch of research on. He just came out with a book called uh, the, the Story of the Human Body. Um, it's a, an evolutionary biological point of view of why we are so awesome of what we are. Now, that's where sweat comes in. The reason why we became, and this is all gonna tie, nobody's brought this up yet. I haven't seen it coming up, but it just dawned on me listening to all of you this week, is that we are the species we become because we can sweat. And what we would do, our hunting skill went like this. We ended up with this incredible brain on the opposite end of some incredible you know, uh, transportation devices, our own feet, developed this skill. We were able to do, which no other animal does, 
look at footprints and be able to interpret what that means. Where they're going, how heavy they are, what, what's the circumstance. No other animal does that. They have all kinds of other skills. But nobody reads footprints, reads, uh, reads them in like a language. And the San people actually tell stories through how animals move, they'll go through, and their body movements will demonstrate all of that. What's so exciting about that is when they start being able to read a footprint, they would be able to pick out an animal, an 800-pound animal, middle of the day. Most other animals aren't trying to get around. They can't, you know, they're not able to sweat. So our ability to sweat allowed us to follow animals, to track them, to run them, get them going into a, a trot, prevent them, people still are doing this in South Africa, prevent them from resting. And two to five hours later, you have an 800 pound, by the way, they round them up and bring them back to the village. You have 800 pounds of nutrient dense food. And let me tell you, if you can go see some films, when the hunters bring back after they've run, done a persistence hunt and they're coming back with the food, fat, when you bring fat back, the women get really happy, okay? It's a really happy moment. So, so what's really beautiful about the San people, and this is gonna tie into another, so I'm, I'm coming as a runner to sweat. And I'm coming as a runner. There's another thing that runners get, and the San people know a lot about this. They equate running. They know it's good because it feels good in their body. Running today is all driven by fads and times and distances and running like a machine and all this. Human beings don't run that way. We, you know, that whole idea of keeping time, everything, to keep track, that, that's never been part of the human condition until very recently. That's all part of like measuring everything. And wanting, great, you know, it's super important. And, do that kind of stuff, but let's face it, back to the idea. The important stuff isn't really in the numbers. Those numbers are helping us to prove what we already know is important, right? So these people already were part of that. And one so super interesting thing, and this was, I was getting ready to give a talk with Daniel Lieberman in front of the New York uh, Marathon, before the marathon, and he came up to me and he said, Barefoot Ted, go back and Google endocannabinoid. I'm like, what? <laughs> He's like, you're gonna love it. And, and so let me tell you about endocannabinoids. How many of you know what an endocannabinoid is? Okay, yeah, you heard it in the... <laughs> Anybody else? This blows my mind. Mo so many people. So Daniel Lieberman's buddy was doing research on the runner's high. Uh, how many have heard of the runner's high? You've heard of that. And everybody thought, hey, that's endo uh, uh, um, uh, endorphins. But this guy was going, no, no, that euphoria and the area in the brain where it's lighting up, this is not an endorphin experience. The molecule's too big, or there's a variety of different reasons why it wasn't gonna work out that way. So he started doing some more research, and it turns out, and this is now science, that human beings have an endocannabinoid system. And all other long-distance running animals do, too. This was in Nature, I think, about a year ago. And what is an endocannabinoid system, and why is it important? Well, let me tell you, it's very important. How many people have experienced exocannabinoids? They're now legal in Seattle and Washington <laughs> State, right? Exocannabinoids. Why in the world can you smoke marijuana and get an effect? Because you have an endocannabinoid system that's been rewarding you for moving well for, well, for millennia. And I've become very, very familiar with the endocannabinoid experience by being a runner. I've run many, many hundred mile races. I, I saw it much more as a journey to like refamiliarize myself with this ancient piece of technology that we inhabit, it's called our body. And people have, you know, back, at the, back to the end of the 20th century, we were all broken and we needed medicine and we needed special shoes and we needed this and we needed that and oh my God. And then of course we were eating poison, you know, um, we were eating food that was, you know, we wouldn't even feed to animals 100 years before. And we were wondering why we're sick, unhappy, depressed, um, in our little boxes, not moving. Mm -hmm. What I found out is when you start retapping into the fundamental default state of human beings, guess what? The reason we've hung around a long time is because it feels good to be in a healthy, happy body. Once you experience that, man, you're not gonna want the other state. And it turns out that it's not very complicated. If you move well, if you eat well, you're gonna be there. Now, what is this sweat culture? What in the hell happened? Well, guess what? Human beings, where we grew up and where we found all this excitement and happiness, we started like wandering off into other directions and seeing what was going on. And I believe there's a direct connection between sweat culture, the production of endocannabinoids, those happy euphoric, we are all one group uh, familiarity. Nobody's done research on this, but I can tell you from uh, lots of experience with exo, endo, and every other kind of cannabinoid that we are onto something here. It is health giving to make, when people feel good in their bodies, 
the anxiety uh, and fear of the, the, the depression and the hopelessness that comes with the other side of the coin kind of leaves them for a bit. And in that state, I think the body just like gets happy. And when it's happy and feeling good, it just does what a body does. A body is doing all kinds of miraculous things continuously that would still are beyond our understanding and comprehension and will remain a mystery probably for, well, as long as we're around. But one thing that won't be a mystery is what we've all experienced here, I'm pretty sure. And that is the beauty of what it feels like to be luxuriating in our own sweat with our own friends in a beautiful environment that's so simple and basic and yet so far away for so many people at this time. Well, that's not going to last long, I'm pretty sure, because anyone who tastes what we've tasted probably never forgets it, and they probably become sort of a voice for their own people and culture. So let me get to why I'm here, another aspect. I got married in the banya 10 days ago. <laughs> and why in the world would I get married in the banya? Well, the banya, the banya 5 is a um, Russian spa, sauna, whatever, in Seattle. And bath it, house. Bath house. Whatever you want to call it. In my case, what I call it is my temple. Because for me, this is the fundamental religion of our, or fundamental uh, spiritual house or whatever. It's a place where I go almost every day. And in there, it's what I consider to be the holiest place for me. It's where I go to be around my community, my friends. It's where I go to be in the heat, which is you know primal. It's where I go to soak in the salt pool which is like the ancient sea we all came out of. It's the womb. It's where I go to go on the cold plunge and to really feel my body invigorated and re becoming alive. And I have come to the conclusion, and I paid a lot of attention to my body. You know, learning how to run 100 miles above 10,000 feet in a pair of sandals, you get pretty good at paying attention to what the hell's happening to you while it's happening. Because if you don't, you're not going to be able to run 100 miles in the mountains above 10,000 feet. And paying attention to what happens to me in the banya has been the greatest health discovery I've ever found. And it goes like this. You are oscillating yourself between two certain deaths. It's almost like the Buddhist hell, cold hell, hot hell. And if you look at these maps of the Buddhist heavens and hells, there's six realms, and one of the realms is hot and cold hells. But Buddha sits up here, and there's a moon over here, and my company is called Luna. And Buddha, if you can go into that state of being able to know when to oscillate yourself between hot and cold, you reach the place of nirvana. Nirvana is learning how to be mindful enough to know when to come, when to go. It's the flow. Your sweat is flowing. Your body is flowing. And you, you, the, those of us who in this room know that feeling, when you're there, it's enlightenment. It's as good as it's going to get. It's the beautiful experience. And what we all know right now, every single human being practically that's alive, this is available to them. This is not, you know, that doesn't, there's no medicine involved that needs to be taken from externally. There's no, you know, there's primal things. Like anyone anywhere could, you know, in, need, if they needed to start a fire, you know, let's hope, you know, in the city we have to have buildings. But this is a, it's like an available primal experience. So, being married in the banya, which went from, I, I call my little culture that we've created in the banya five, I want to say, here's what you need to do out there if you want to create these cultures. You've got to have the right tools. You've got to have quality tools. You've got to have a place where it gets hot. It's got to get hot. Can't be like, you know, crappy, low, and it's got to be built with thought and care. And you've got to have a place where you get cold. It's got, you've got to have that. It seems to me that you've got to have a cold. And it seems like a good idea to have a pool, you know, like a body temperature pool with some salt in there. I think with those three things, you could have, you know, a very pervasive and happy experience. And for me, getting married in that banya, we started in the parolka. So the, the whole wedding was planned. It took a week. And it was all talked about in the parolka. I, I go in the parolka. I get all my news in the parolka. I have no access to the outside world other than what people are talking about in the parolka, uh, the hot box, uh, the sauna. 
Yeah, and nobody in that, you know, in the, in, the, in the Perilka, generally you don't get the parroting of the news that people in their daily life, you know, people are basically just like basically unpaid uh, purveyors of whatever has been told to them on the radio or the television. The Perilka, I don't get that. I get people telling the stories of their lives, of their triumphs, of their, uh, their family, of their, and this has been the, another aspect of that enriching experience that you're not going to pretty much get anywhere else. We call it like cheers without alcohol. And so I decided, Iram and I decided we needed, we were already essentially living at partners then it became essential that we needed to get married for you know, immigration reasons. And we got our license and then just talking to our friends and then my one friend Daniel said, well I'm a, I can do, a, you know, I do ceremonies. Like we kind of knew that, okay, you're, you're that. And then I just really quickly thought, okay, I'll be in the parolka and we'll, uh, he'll t tell us to do our little vows there. Then we'll go out of the parolka, so that we were preliminal, liminal, and then we dropped it. So. And then we got to the cold plunge, and that's where he handed us our rings. And I thought he was going to do some ceremony. He handed us our rings and said, okay, say something now. And our friends were filming all this on iPhones, of course. And so we exchanged our vows, and we jumped into the cold plunge, and then we went over into the salt pool. We took the plunge. We took the plunge. We took the plunge. And then we went over the salt pool, and then we got in there, and everybody and everybody was so happy, and it was just all friends, and it went from zero to a hundred in less than a week, and there was Where's no sweat, ring? no Where's stress. Where's your bride here? Well, we we decided to go here, and my bride's here. She was the uh, Turkish uh, Turkish hammam expert who went one time. So in the end, I just want to say this, you guys, we are on to something here. This is something, you know, it's almost, I have people in the, in the bond who say, don't tell anybody, you know what's going to ruin it. And it's like, oh, damn. No, but I do think it's like this. If you've heard of this concept of new American cuisine, which is, uh, there's a place called Venus down in Berkeley that I really like. But it's this idea, what I think we're going to do in America, since we don't need to get into the, let's say, pissing contest of who's got the better this, that, or the other. What we need to do is we pull it all together, take what we like. If people like it, guess what? They'll come. And then I, I believe in this concept of autopoiesis, self-forming systems. When you put human beings who instantaneously, and this is what a banya does every time for me, instantaneously reduces suffering in your mind and your body all in one fell swoop. I mean, that's whole religions are formed to do that. Bhakti yoga, you know, you, you do yoga to get the, you know, the, the, the suffering out of your body. Then you do meditation to get the suffering out of your mind. And then you do some chanting to celebrate this new place. And then you go and have a happy meal. Well, let me tell you, bam, banya, 100% guaranteed. It's the religion that is perfect for me. Because it's efficient and clean. So thank you very much.